Welcome to Learn With Us. This is the first lecture of Basic Electronics. The topics that we are going to cover in this course include Solid State Theory, Network Theorem, Diode and its applications, Transistors, also known as BJTs, and Introduction to Field Effect Transistor, which includes JFETs and MOSFETs. The text and reference books for this course include Electronic Devices and Circuit Theory by Bolstead and Nashelsky, 11th edition, Microelectronic Circuits by Cedra and Smith, 7th edition, and Electronic Devices by Floyd, 9th edition. All these books are available on the internet, so you guys can download them easily. Now, a question arises, why this course is important? Electronics enables engineers and inventors to create solutions that tackle the world's problems and improve lives. Today, everyone has a smartphone which is capable of incredible things containing highly complex processors, advanced communications, and packed with electronics. Through exciting developments in electronics, we can develop innovative products and help transform the way we live from healthcare to entertainment. In the future, we will see smart cities with transportation, energy consumption, security, and water use all improved through electronics. What are the learning objectives of this lecture? To understand electronics and its applications, to understand structure of atoms and to study materials that are used in electronics. Now, what is electronics? Electronics is an applied form of science that deals with electrons. The definition of electronics technically says electronics is an engineering branch that concerns with the flow of current through semiconductor, gas or any form of matter. Now, what are the applications of electronics? First is consumer electronics. These are devices and equipments that are meant for everyday use. They include printers, scanners, personal computers, home appliances, audio video systems, etc. Second is industrial electronics. This industry is powerful in making real-time automation. This include industrial automation and motion control, machine learning, motor drive control, mechatronics and robotics, power converting technologies, renewable energy applications, power electronics and biomechanics. Micro-industrial design is at micro level. It includes microchips, diodes, 
transistors, etc. Third is medical applications, advanced sophisticated instruments are being developed for data recording and physiological analysis. They are proven to be more useful in diagnosis of diseases and for healing purpose. Some of the medical devices and equipments that are commonly used are pacemaker. A pacemaker is a small device that is placed in the chest or abdomen to help control abnormal heart rhythms. This device uses electrical pulses to prompt the heart to beat at a normal rate. Second is glucose meter. It is also known as a glucometer or blood glucose monitoring device. It is a home measurement system you can use to test the amount of glucose that is sugar in your blood. Next is digital thermometer. The digital thermometers are used to sense the temperature of the body and these devices are portable. They have permanent probes and a convenient digital display. These devices are used in different industries to control processes in scientific research, the study of weather and in medicine. Now here is your class task. What are the applications of electronics in communication? Take three minutes to complete this task. Now another question arises. Is electrical engineering same as electronics? Well, electrical engineering is different from electronics. The electrical is the flow of electrons while the electronics is the technique of controlling the flow of electrons for doing the particular work. However, the working principle of both of them is same, that is, they both use the electrical energy for doing work. The main difference between electrical and electronic circuits is that electrical circuits have no decision making capability but electronic circuits have this decision making capability which is also known as processing now what are atoms an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains the characteristics of that element. In other words, an element is a substance that is made entirely from one type of atom. According to classical Bohr model, atoms have a planetary type of structure that consists of a central nucleus surrounded by orbiting electrons as shown in this figure. This nucleus consists of positively charged particles called protons and uncharged particles called neutrons. The basic particles of negative charge are called electrons. It means atoms 
consists of electrons, protons and neutrons. Each of the known 118 elements has atoms that are different from the atoms of all other elements. Each type of atom has a certain number of electrons and protons that distinguishes it from the atoms of all other elements. It means each element in the periodic table has a unique atomic structure. For example, the element hydrogen is made from atoms containing just one proton and one electron. It does not have a neutron and this atomic structure is specific to hydrogen element only. All atoms within a given element have the same number of protons. The atomic number equals the number of protons in the nucleus which is same as the number of electrons in an electrically balanced that is neutral atom. Now we will understand the difference between valence electron and free electron. Electrons with the highest energy exist in the outermost shell of an atom and are relatively loosely bound to the atom. This outermost shell is known as the valence shell and electrons in this shell are called valence electrons. These valence electrons contribute to chemical reactions and bonding within the structure of a material and determine its electrical properties. Now we'll talk about free electrons. If a valence electron acquires a sufficient amount of energy, which is called ionization energy, it can actually escape from the outer shell and the atom's influence. The departure of a valence electron leaves a previously neutral atom with an excess of positive charge that is more protons than electrons. The process of losing a valence electron is known as ionization and the resulting positively charged atom is called a positive ion and this escaped valence electron is called a free electron. Now we will talk about energy levels. Electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom at certain distances from the nucleus. Electrons near the nucleus have less energy than those electrons that are present in more distant orbits. Each discrete distance that is orbit from the nucleus corresponds to a certain energy level. It means in an atom, the orbits are grouped into energy levels that are known as shells. A given atom has a fixed number of shells. Each shell has a maximum number of electrons that are also fixed. The maximum number of electrons that can exist in each shell can be calculated by this formula Ne is equals to 
2n square where n is the number of the shell. Now look at this figure. As you can see this is nucleus. This is first energy level or shell 1. This is second energy level or shell 2. This is third energy level or shell 3. In order to find the maximum number of electrons that can exist in first shell, we can write its value in place of n that is 1. For second shell, this n will be 2. For third shell, this n will be 3. This is how you can calculate maximum number of electrons that can exist in that particular shell. Now we will talk about materials that are used in electronics. All materials are made up of atoms. These atoms contribute to the electrical properties of a material including its ability to conduct electrical current. In terms of their electrical properties, materials can be classified into three groups. First is insulators. An insulator is a material that does not conduct electrical current under normal conditions. Valence electrons are tightly bound to the atoms. Therefore, there are very few free electrons in an insulator. Examples of insulators are rubber, plastic, glass, etc. Second group is conductors. A conductor is a material that easily conducts electrical current. In conductors, valence electrons are very loosely bound to the atom. These loosely bound valence electrons become free electrons. Therefore, in a conductive material, the free electrons are valence electrons. Most metals are good conductors. The best conductors are single element materials such as copper, silver, gold. In addition to metals, salt can also conduct electricity. There are no free electrons in salts, so the conductivity depends on ions. When a salt is melting or dissolving, these ions are free to move. Third group of materials that are used in electronics include semiconductors. A semiconductor is a material that is between insulators and conductors in its ability to conduct electrical current. A semiconductor in its pure or intrinsic form is neither a good conductor nor a good insulator. There are two types of semiconductors. First is single element semiconductor. The single element semiconductors are characterized by atoms with four valence electrons. These single element semiconductors are silicon, antimony, arsenic, boron, etc. Second type of 
semiconductors are compound semiconductors compound semiconductors are semiconductors that are made from two or more elements compound semiconductors such as gallium arsenide silicon germanium silicon carbide are most commonly used silicon is the most commonly used semiconductor it is a sand particle in pure form at 0 kelvin silicon is an insulator silicon gets better at conducting electricity as the temperature increases so the crucial difference between conductors semiconductors and insulators rely on their level of conductivity this conductivity depends on valence electrons if these valence electrons are loosely bound to the atoms then they become free electrons and conduct electrical current such as in conductors if these valence electrons are tightly bound to the atoms then they do not become free electrons and do not conduct electrical current such as in insulators now we will understand the band model the electronic band structure describes the conductivity of conductors insulators and semiconductors it consists of two energy bands that is valence and conduction band and the band gap the valence electrons which serve as charge carriers are located in the valence band in the ground state the conduction band is occupied with no electrons the ground state of an atom is the stationary state of the atom with lowest possible energy when an electron acquires enough additional energy it can leave the valence shell and become a free electron and then it exists in what is known as the conduction band the difference in energy between the valence band and the conduction band is called a band gap or an energy gap it is a region in insulators and semiconductors where no electron states exist the width of band gap affects the conductivity of materials in order to achieve a conductivity electrons from the valence band have to move into the conduction band now look at this figure it shows energy diagrams for insulator semiconductor and conductor this is the band model of insulator in insulators the valence band is fully occupied with electrons due to the covalent bonds these electrons cannot move because they are locked up between the atoms as you can see the band gap in insulators is very large this band gap can be crossed only when breakdown conditions occur that is when a very high voltage is applied across the material now look at this band model of semiconductor 
in semiconductors the band gap is smaller which allows an electron in the valence band to jump into the conduction band if it absorbs a photon this band gap depends on the semiconductor material now look at this band model of conductor in conductors the conduction band and valence band overlap so there is no gap as shown here this means that electrons in the valence band move freely into the conduction band so there are always electrons available as free electrons now we will compare a semiconductor atom to a conductor atom we know that silicon is a semiconductor and copper is a conductor bohr diagrams of the silicon atom and the copper atom are shown here in this figure as you can see this is core this core includes everything except the valence electrons note that the core of the silicon atom has a net charge of plus 4 it means there are 14 protons and 10 electrons in this silicon atom the core of the copper atom has a net charge of plus 1 it means there are 29 protons and 28 electrons in the copper atom the valence electron in the copper atom feels an attractive force of plus 1 whereas the valence electron in the silicon atom feels an attractive force of plus 4 therefore there is more force trying to hold a valence electron to the atom in silicon then in copper the copper's valence electron is in the fourth shell which is at a greater distance from its nucleus as you can see here whereas the silicon's valence electron is in the third shell we know that electrons farthest from the nucleus have the most energy so the valence electron in the copper atom has more energy than the valence electron in the silicon atom it means that it is easier for valence electrons in copper to acquire enough additional energy to escape from their atoms and become free electrons then it is in silicon what are the key takeaways of this lecture in this lecture you understood what is electronics and what are its applications you also understood the atomic structure of elements in this lecture you also studied about the materials that are used in electronics you studied that these materials are classified into three groups that is conductors semiconductors and insulators you also studied about the band model of insulators conductors and semiconductors Thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions, then write your questions in comment section of this video. Don't forget to subscribe our channel and share it with your friends and family. Thank you.